Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the behaviour-based UX research partner for enterprise leaders who need an independent perspective to align hearts and minds, and also the home of New Zealand's first and only world-class human-centred research and innovation lab. If that sounds interesting, you can find out more about what we do at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management, and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is Wendy Johansson. Wendy is the co-founder and chief product experience officer at Me Salute, a company that's on a mission to provide affordable, culturally authentic, physical, and mental health care for the Latinx community in the USA and Mexico. Before starting Me Salute, Wendy worked at Amazon, where she launched the inaugural UX Design and Research Apprenticeship Program, a program that provided a pathway to UX careers for people from underrepresented communities and non-traditional backgrounds. Wendy has also been the Global Vice President of User Experience at Publicis Sapient, where she led a team of over 1,000 designers and partnered with the then CXO, Dr. John Maeda, to transform a largely traditional agency into an experience-led consultancy. And while that's all very impressive, it's not what Wendy is most proud of. Back in 2013, Wendy co-founded WiseLine, a global product development company where she was VP of UX and Academy. At WiseLine, Wendy built and managed a global team of over 75 designers and founded WiseLine Academy, a training organization that democratized the learning of tech skills and entrepreneurship in the emerging markets where the company operated. Wendy is an official member of the invitation-only Forbes Technology Council, a mentor to the next generation of design leaders through the On Deck Design Fellowship, an advisor to the cybersecurity company Serbi, and the design mentoring platform ADP List. She is also part of the venture board for Compu Soluciones, LATAM Fund, as well as a UX fellow and advisor to WiseLine. And now she's kindly here with me for this conversation on Brave UX. Wendy, hello and a very warm welcome to the show. Hello, Brendan. Thank you for that uh, mouthful of an intro. And uh, now I see why my team likes to have uh, bingo games about, you know, how many roles does Wendy actually have on LinkedIn? I didn't realize (laughs) there were so many in there. Yeah, you certainly have a, a rich profile and it provided me with lots of interesting things to tell people about in your intro. You've certainly <laughs> led a very um, successful and very well-storied career and I'm looking forward to getting into some of those things with you today. I want to actually start by winding the clock back mm, quite a, a lot here, I'm taking us back to between November 2006 and April 2007, and that's when you took a self-described career hiatus and you did something pretty interesting. How did you spend that time? Let me start with how that career hiatus came. I'm sure a long time ago I wrote it on some resume and LinkedIn as a career hiatus. That was the first time I got laid off. Mm. That was my first job out of college. I got laid off. And it was such an interesting time back then because uh, I was working for a startup and I had built the UI of their video platform. And they said, that's cool. You're you're done with the UI. Now, we don't actually have any other work for you. Either learn to code or you have no job, which today in what design is, nobody would ever call design done. So I just wanted to share like (laughs) that's where that came from. And that, I mean, even back then, that led to so much self-doubt, like, out of university, one of my first jobs, I literally went home and cried to my parents of like, what am I going to do? And they're like, well, you're not going to learn to code. So time to take a break. (laughs) That's what they told me. How did it, how did that break? And how did that uh, unfortunate event, how did that change your view on what it meant to be a designer and, and design maybe more, more broadly? How did that affect that? Um, I, I think what it helped me realize, at least like starting from my parents' perspective of, you know, well, go ahead and take your break. It's not like you're going to learn to do something else that you don't enjoy doing. Cause I actually started in university as a CS major. I couldn't get through that first coding course, JavaScript. And I was like, this is not it for me. And so I, I stayed on this path of cognitive science and, and design. And I, I think what it taught me was just, you know, with the support of my parents at that such young age, don't give up on your principles, like stick to that. If design is what you want to do, you'll go find another job there. And until then, you know, go, go do some stuff. 
and that goes to the second part of my story. What did I do during that period? Um, I was in a band and <laughs> that day when, after, you know, I talked to my parents and I was all devastated and I went to band practice to see my bandmates, uh, they were bummed out. And I was like, why are you guys bummed out? Like, I'm the one who lost my job. Uh, and they said, well, you're the only <laughs> person with like a full-time job because, you know, they worked at cafes and whatnot. And they said, we just got a touring deal in Japan, but you're the only person with full-time jobs. So like, we all know you're not going to go. So then we can't go. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is what my parents meant. It's going to work out. Like it worked out that same day. My Serendipity. mom got a touring gig in Japan. So we went off and did that. And I said, I don't have a job. Let's go. And so we had something like about 30 tour dates over a month and a half in Japan. And it was just kind of spread out. And we went a little early. We just got to know the different neighborhoods. Um, we stayed there a little longer afterwards. It was just a whole lot of fun. Now, Japan is... Like a bit of a mystical place for me. I have to admit that I've never been there. I, ha I have had a number of uh, family members, friends, people that have travelled there, and they they really rave about it. It's got such a strong culture, and it seems to be such a, a unique place in the world. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression, or what is maybe the lasting impression um, that you still have with you of your time in Japan? Ah, uh, that uh, the the first impression, and also a lasting impression for me, really sits around kind of what what the venues look like actually. So first day we show up in a van, they show, they should take us there around two o'clock for sound check with the other bands. And we're in what looks like a downtown central business district, financial towers all over everybody in, you know, black business suits, just looking very serious. And we're like, did you drop us off at the right place? You just dropped <laughs> off a bunch of like strange looking American kids with all, you know, their band gear, like in the middle of a CBD, like what's going on here? And they said, oh, no, it's this door right here in the base of one of these financial towers. And they open it up and it is just like blasting the moment they open the door. But you close it totally silent and soundproof. And the first off for me, that was just like, oh, so this kind of creative creativity, this this, you know, what most people call like a nightlife scene, a little more punk rock. Like this is just integrated in the middle of this. There's no district that's like the punk district, the club district. It's just part of everyday society and you know they have really great sound uh, soundproofing so you couldn't hear anything but the second part of that is when we started playing the show that night you know i was also hanging out at the merch table because we weren't playing first and so i'm watching all these people coming in and paying their fee and the folks coming in were the same people who were outside in the daytime doing these jobs in their business suits. And they would come in, like loosen the tie, take off the jacket, buy a merch t-shirt, pull it on over the button up. And they're like, yeah, we're just here to see these cool bands from America for the night. And I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> and the lasting impression for me is, you know, just, just coming into, again, like in this corporate world, out of university, got laid off on my first job, looking at this and being like, just because you look some way doesn't mean you are some way. Whereas I feel yes. like in the United States, like even in, let's just say I go work at, I go to a bank and all the coworkers there are very serious looking. You can tell the person with the eyebrow piercing or this, you know, the tats like popping up on their sleeve. Like you can tell when somebody's a little different, but in Japan, everybody looks exactly the same and you just don't know what they're into. And I think that's super cool. Like you just cannot judge people the same way that I feel like we do so much in the U.S. Mm, what an insight that is. And and I think it's it's something that plays out here in New Zealand. I feel like we conform quite strictly to perhaps the expectations of others or as we, you know, it's just less obvious, I suppose, what you're saying about the people in Japan. You couldn't really pick them on the street as to who was going to be in the club and, and who mm -hmm. wasn't. Music clearly was important to you at that point of your life. And I haven't actually come across anything that you've said about it since. So I'm curious, mm. is this something, you know, this playing in bands, this this energy that you must have had when you were on stage, is this something that's still part of your life? You know, you're a busy founder now. You've done many other things in your career. Is this something that still stays with you? Yeah, um, I, I will, I'll phrase it this way. Oftentimes people will ask me either after a conference or even co-workers within my company to say like, how did you get so brave? And, you know, you can go speak in front of anybody about anything. I was like, oh no, like total introvert, super shy person. Like if I have to go to a business dinner and it's more than four people, super awkward. I'm not going to say anything because I don't know how to interject <laughs> into conversations with groups. So like it appears some way. And I would say being able to um, have played in a band, have sung in a band, it, like that really helped me build up a persona. In the same way, I've read interviews about Beyonce, about, you know, how does she come on stage in these costumes and she is Queen Bey? Like, how is this possible? And she's like, oh, no, it's just a character I play. 
when I go on stage, like I'm putting on these costumes for this character and I'm that character when I'm up there. But as a normal human being, she's like, no, a little introverted, a little shy, like a little quiet, but you know, not the same character you're putting on stage. And I would say that's, that's how I feel about business is I know a lot of people tend to say like, well, I'm an introvert. I get so exhausted by all these meetings and negotiating on design and talking to executives. I don't, feel that it's, it's exhausting because I treat it as, all right, we're putting on the costume. I'm going to go sell something. I'm going to go convince somebody of something. I'm going to go close a deal. I'm going to go close a candidate, whatever those things are. Like, all right, we're putting the costume on. Here's a persona. This is who I got to be. Well, let's talk about that in relation to your time working with Dr. John Maeda at Publicis Sapient. Because I feel like, at least in my head, I'm I'm wondering if there's a, a, a connection between a couple of dots here. So you left WiseLine, which was the company that you founded, and I, w- I want to go into that as well separately, mm-hmm. to work with John at Publicist Sapient. And I think I mentioned in your introduction that was a really large design organisation, over a 1,000 mm-hmm. designers across you know 30-plus offices globally. What did John say to you to compel you or to, to, to at least – light that fire inside you that you might want to move on from your time at WiseLine? Like what was it that he said that made you feel like Publicist Sapient was the next thing for you? Uh, It wasn't the company. It was him actually. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He could have been anywhere. And I I think it would have just been at the time, you know, I had never, number one, never had a design boss in my entire career. I'd always reported to business people president of product, a CEO, Um, some points I reported to a CTO, but I never had a design leader in my organization that I could report to. And then second, I had largely been in early startup tech in the 2000s where it was a bunch of bros. Like they were literally doing keg stands at 7.30 at night or they would pull out <laughs> poker. And then, you know, my one of my second job after I got back from the band, and I remember the one guy came up to me the first day. He was like, I had to put on a clean shirt today because of you. And I was like, what the fuck? And, you know, today you wouldn't imagine people saying these things in the yeah. office, much less the woman, much less the only woman of color in the office. So it's just, it was a, it was a different time. And so I think for mm-hmm. John... I had never felt like I was missing something or I didn't know that. And just seeing an Asian American just rising up to leadership in these very homogenous spaces uh, was really, really interesting for me. And I, I, I don't know, it it was just something where I'm like, okay, I don't think I've worked with a design leader. I don't think I've worked with somebody who looks like me. So let's, let's go see what's going on. And this was, I think this was a burgeoning moment back in, um, 2019, when there was now being a lot of conversation within corporate, uh, within these tech spaces and and teams of, you know, what's happening with Black Lives Matter? What's happening with all these unjust Black deaths uh, from the hands of police? And so people were starting to talk about that in the workplace. And I think race was coming up more because before that, the big conversation was gender equity. And now this was just equity, equity. And so how do we bring these conversations in? And that started opening my eyes with like, okay, what would it look like to actually report to also a leader who's not a white guy? Let's go figure this out. And you've spoke earlier on about Beyonce, for example, needing to put on that persona or play that particular role. And I think you likened it to the way that um, when you were on stage, you had to do the same. You know, naturally you incline more towards the introverted end of the scale. How did you or who did you have to become working alongside John to lead a design org at such scale, like what shift and at such a critical moment in, in, mm-hmm. in, in cultural context for America, like how did you have to change or adapt or behave in a way that you were able to be successful or um, have the kind of influence that you were seeking to have in that leadership position? I had to learn a lot. I did not walk into that role at a pivotal moment coming in, knowing how to talk about race, how to talk about trauma, how to talk about, you know, walking into the pandemic and everybody's remote and all the duties that especially women had at home. And I didn't know how to talk about any of that. <laughs> and I think what really worked for me within John, uh, within John's team, and you know, there's a couple of us, but being able to have that open space to say, hey, okay, we're going to learn to talk about this. 
And John set a great example of every week saying like, hey, this is what I learned this week. I'm going to share it back out because some of you don't know this. I've learned some new terms. I've learned some new news. I've seen some new data. And we're just going to talk about this. And learning together, learning out loud, I think was really uh, pivotal for me because that not only kind of set the model for for having these conversations uh, with people, but also being able to say this is just a great leadership behavior that can be modeled around anything. Um, and I think because he was so open and curious and unlearning and constantly learning, that made it a safe space for the entire organization to say, OK, I want to go on this journey. I don't know how to talk about this. This is uncomfortable. They're talking about this. Or, you know, why are we having a CXO and some some super VPs talking about this in a meeting? Like, this is weird. We've never done this at the company. Well, we're shifting. We're changing the culture. And it, it takes it definitely takes, I would say, top down green light to be able to do that but it does take the rest of the organization to say i think this is a safe space that i can be brave in well you talked about changing the culture and there's you know obviously the corporate culture of a global agency like Publis publicist mm -hmm. sapient but there's also like the i suppose the culture that exists between colleagues or the culture of or maybe the awareness of noticing that everyone looks fairly similar like there's there's that kind of cultural awareness as well like what we look on the like on the inside of our organization doesn't necessarily reflect what the world looks like on the outside and the status quo is often a very powerful force you know it's a, it's a very difficult thing to shift yet it does it does shift now about your time at publicist sapient you said you've said before and i'll quote you now the goal was to modernize what was very much a legacy agency mentality of art directors creative directors mm -hmm. creative talent who were just told to make things pretty now you're talking about there like just that traditional dynamic of a, an agency trying to uh, modernize itself to deal with the challenges of a, of a digital world and a changing yeah. world. Now that that sounds like a really challenging situation on 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 that degree. But please feel free to expand this to encompass any of the um, conversation around equity that was also happening alongside of like the work stuff. If those things can be separated, where did you and John and your team? when you first arrived at the agency, where did you decide to focus your efforts? Because you can only do so much, right? Like where did you decide to start changing the culture and why? Why did you decide to start where you did? Uh, John developed something called LEAD and it, I, it, what did it stand for? Light, ethical, accessible, and dataful. And he kind of said, these are the four elements that make really good design. And he was basically trying to define user experience or product design uh, to our customers with some unified language. And it wasn't it wasn't groundbreaking in the way that like, well, yeah, you know, having light experiences, dataful, accessible, ethical experiences. We all know we should do that. Um, but it was the fact that he put unifying language around this. So not only within the organization, we knew how to define kind of this more this more progressive product design culture. But also we had that same language to our clients and we were able to use that in the marketing. And when we had sales conversations with the clients, we we're able to say, this is how we're going to measure what you had before and then how we made an impact to change. You know, we're going to benchmark uh, product behaviors and, and loading times. We're going to see how people are using it. We're going to see how people are feeling about your brand and the digital products there. And so I think in, in bringing that to the table, that was something that helped start shifting the culture because what I did was I kind of took this internal roadshow tour over uh, Microsoft Teams and I talked to every single team about lead. I did a presentation with them. They were very interactive. It helped them kind of look at their own work as recruiters, as marketers, as data scientists, as HR people. Like, how do we create light, ethical, accessible, dataful employee experiences, candidate experiences, um, visitor experiences to our website, uh, or people who are coming into, you know, any of our trade show events uh, as a marketing team. So it gave everybody kind of common language to measure success and define good design, whether that's for clients, for people we're building for, for our own employees. And I think that really kind of started a, a little bit of rethinking of cultures, like how do we center this you know, within an agency consultancy, again, about people rather than just margins. Mm. Ethical is part of that lead 
mm-hmm. framework. Now, ethics extends way outside the purview of design. It's something yeah. that should really uh, be part of, of all decision-making, regardless of whether it's design decision-making. You've previously spoken about, and I'll paraphrase you now, about how it's really refreshing that young designers in particular uh, come into the workplace feeling empowered to have a voice to point out things that aren't quite right with the status quo. And that is perhaps different to your own experience when you were around their age, you know, a recent graduate and the type of conversations you felt that you were empowered to have. What is it that you feel has shifted in that time, you know, since your first job, for example, and these jobs that these recent graduates were having at Publicist Sapient? What is it you feel that has allowed them or is is empowering them to have perhaps a more substantial voice than our generation did when we first entered the workplace? What's empowered them? I, I, you know, I'm going to go back to learning and knowing how to talk about it. The fact that they're in high school, they're in university, they're looking at Instagram, TikTok, whatever, and people are willing to call things out and willing to talk about, you know, this is what it means to have generational trauma as an immigrant child and be able to learn the terminology and I guess learn to navigate the situations where they can say, Hey, I think this thing is happening to me. Of course, there's the far other end of it where everybody, you know, 24 seven is like, somebody's gaslighting me. And it's like, no, that's not what gaslighting is actually, but (laughs) being able to learn how to talk about it and learn that, you know, that's not okay that people are doing that to you. Like basically learning to understand how they could set boundaries in their life. I think this has been able to empower a lot of this new generation to say, Hey, I don't think this is right. You know, I, I, I think you should be telling us, how we should be completing, you know, this learning while we're also working on projects on uh, on the clock because there's about a 40 hour a week. And my Amazon apprentice said this to me at some point. They're like, we have about a 40 hour a week. We're supposed to be spending two thirds of that time learning in our uh, in our online bootcamp, basically, and doing the homework. But the homework takes a whole 40 hours itself. Like, where are we supposed to find that time? And, you know, one answer is definitely, hey, if you want it, this is the opportunity. Work your butt off and do those extra hours and get there. But on the other hand, who am I to say that to, you know, women with children who are sitting at home during the first couple of months of the pandemic or, you know, folks who are worried about, am I even going to have enough for rent next month or, you know, how this is going to work out? So it, it is something that I think as people have learned and been more open to talk about it, it's empowered them. And I think learning how to bring those conversations up in the workplace is something that a lot of managers of new designers can help them learn. It's not just, hey, let me teach you all these new things in Figma or this new research process, like teaching them workplace etiquette, how to breach conversation, broach conversations, how to bring these things up, how to, you know, have a conversation with others about a problem that you don't know a solution to versus, you know, where does that board line into you're just complaining and being negative and toxic, like being able to have conversations with your team about what those boundaries are also for as a leader or a manager, I think is incredibly important. And that continues to empower people to say, I've been heard, or this is how I can bring things to be heard. Well, let's go into that because I've heard you talk previously about a story of a young mentee of yours who was getting branded with this label of being a bit negative or overly negative at work. And it was because I understand that they were regularly pointing out problems and you asked them when they were pointing out these problems if they were also coming along with some solutions Mm -hmm. to the problems. And they said to you that they were, but it was often just one solution, which was their preferred solution, the one that they felt was the best. What did you share with that mentee about the approach that they were taking that was perhaps they could change to be more, that they could perhaps change to be more effective in in trying to address some of these issues, these problems, perhaps these injustices that they were seeing at the workplace? Um, in that particular story, humorously, I can think this could be a number of people. <laughs> so I'm going to follow on uh, what I think of most recently. I, I did have someone basically bring up the same problem of like, you know, I, I keep bringing these things up in the workplace and they're not fixing it. And as we kind of dug into the conversation, it came, I came to realize their idea of fixing it was their one single idea of what the solution should be and the only way it should be. And there was no give for understanding this only actually directly answers your perspective of the situation. It doesn't answer other people who are having similar issues. So this broad solution that was implemented, it wasn't specific enough for them, but it actually helped more people. 
And so we, we talked through that. We talked about, you know, how that generally impacted more people, how your direct, that person's direct solution wasn't specific, uh, was too specific to them. And it actually caused more problems for other people if it was implemented and how they didn't actually go dive in and go find out like, why did this get solution get implemented? Like somebody heard your problem. That's great. You complained enough about it or something, but why wasn't your solution chosen? Why, what other considerations were put in place? And so when they went to investigate that after a conversation, they came back a little more thoroughly humbled about it and say, actually, I realized that they, they didn't implement what I wanted, but I feel really good that I, I brought my voice up because it actually helped solve the same pain for so many other people that were you know too nervous or didn't know how to bring it up or didn't know who to talk to. And so they, they went from kind of being angry about like, they never listened to me to kind of proud of like, oh, I have impact here. Like, I just need to broaden my view and, you know, take off the, the blinders and say, wow, okay, this impacted a lot more people than I thought it could. And so they, they started opening this up to thinking with the next problem that they wanted to solve uh, within their organization to go talk to other people to get their perspectives and say, all right, let's figure out kind of more of a universal solution or a bunch of ideas and then bring it up to leadership to say, hey, we see this problem. We see these different ideas that could apply to other people. Uh, what should we do about this? What do you think a good direction is? Mm, so there's lots in there. There's lots in there about uh, being inquisitive, collaborating with others, not stopping or not getting frustrated at the first sign that things aren't necessarily playing out the way that you'd like them to, being able to see success in various lights, heaps of stuff in there. I wanted to touch on something that perhaps is apparent in our careers as we progress from being you know juniors for example through to seniors and then potentially into management you now we sort of shift from being those uh, people that point out the problems and 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 agitate for a change to the status quo to being the establishment or at least we can be perceived to be the establishment the mm-hmm. further along we get in our careers and maybe sometimes we do fall into that groove as well you've spoken about how organizations need to create more of a bottom up culture so that people can surface these problems and that leadership isn't all command and control but you've also touched on the other side of this which is perhaps it's the the less popular part of the discussion and I just want to quote you now you've said also it's on the new generation to not just look at leadership as I need to break this this is wrong but how do we educate and meet somewhere in the middle for something that works for both of us so in that framing of people that are in positions of management needing to come to some middle ground with the people that are newer in the organizations or younger or the ones that are surfacing up some of the issues that we might not be privy to. What does that healthy middle ground, like what does that relationship or how how does that dance ideally look like? How should we be doing that together? Yeah, um, I'll reframe that as well into I don't think change can be made unless it's both grassroots bottoms up and also top down that kind of fits in the parameters of either that corporation, the goals, you know, somebody's relationship, whatever it is. And I think that in, in approaching both ways and being able to kind of build this relationship where you're, you're kind of hearing both sides and, and helping them understand, you know, we heard you, but we're going this way because, or we decided that uh, taking a mismatch of all these ideas and coming up with another one worked because like giving a little context of the why. I mean, honestly, the majority of the time, even as kids, we just wanted to know why our parents told us we couldn't watch TV after 8 p.m. Like they just said, <laughs> you can't watch TV after 8 p.m. But why? Because uh, I think mm. back to when I was a kid and my parents told me I couldn't do that. And nowadays as an adult, I'm like, what, what would happen if I just turned on that TV at 8 p.m.? I'm pretty sure nothing would happen. Uh, you know, I wasn't going to magically turn <laughs> in a pumpkin or something. But I, I think it's it's questioning the why that people get stuck in. Because if you don't give them that answer, what mm. you're left with are people who get to make up the worst case scenarios. They didn't listen to me. They don't respect me. They really, you know, this is something to do with junior designers or people like me, uh, however I want to define and identify. And you don't want to give people that space to make up bad things. And so being able to explain both bottoms up and ups down, I think that is really, really important. So being able to create these safe spaces within your teams where people feel like they can actually share their feedback, their thoughts and things they don't understand. Like I bring up all the time, very openly with my team. I have a stupid question because I am not a doctor, 
what does acute or, you know, acuity mean when it comes to care? Like, to me, like, I know what acute means, but what does that mean in in medical terms? Like, when is it that somebody has something that's low acuity care? Because acute is already low. And I was like, now you call it low acuity. I'm like, what's happening here? And so I will just regularly bring up to my team, hey, I have a stupid question. And they're like, that's not a stupid question. I was like, it is because I didn't know it. So I felt like it was dumb, but I'm going to say it out loud because if I don't know it, somebody else doesn't know it. Basically setting that tone of like, it's okay to have these questions where you're like, Am I the only one who, and the answer is always no, you are not the only one who. So just go ahead and say it out loud and help a bunch of people because they were thinking it, you're just brave enough to ask it. And so I think it's building that relationship to answer the why and and set the tone. And I think this one largely comes from top down to, okay, we're going to hear you and we're going to explain things to you. And I think that that is that relationship that needs to be built and kind of committed to. Mm -hmm. And would it be unfair to also suggest that the people that are bringing up issues to management, you know, surfacing it from the bottom up, that also having the the why clearly explained is an important part of building that understanding between those groups? Absolutely. So you can hear probably back in the uh, rich tech days, which are bygone era now, uh, people would complain, my favorite chips are no longer in the office. This is awful. I'm just going to complain that you stopped serving my favorite chips. And people up top would just be like, who are these entitled children complaining about losing their favorite (laughs) flavor of Cheetos? Like, what the heck is going on? When in fact, a couple of times I've dug into these, what seem like silly requests from people and asked like, okay, so what's wrong with not having these Cheetos anymore? Well, it looks like the company's cutting costs and it makes me wonder like, what's happening up there? Do we not have enough money? Should I be looking for another job? I'm like, okay, just because your favorite chips aren't here. It's actually causing you to wonder if you should find another job, not because we stopped serving your favorite chips, but because it makes you worried about the financial status of the company that we can talk about (laughs) that we can help address versus, oh, my gosh, look at these children. They don't get their you know, favorite chips. And so I feel like that that why, like, why are you worried about this thing? You know, what is really that underlying root cause and the underlying question there that sometimes it could just be like, those are my favorite freaking chips. What's wrong with you? could be as simple as that, but other times it can really bring up some other deeper questions. And, and several times I've uncovered things that I didn't realize people were worried about until, you know, I dug in a bit more like, what does it mean that, you know, they moved the, your team from over there to over here? Oh, it means you're sitting next to the bathroom and it kind of stinks. Okay, let's go figure this out. Not just they moved us away from the windows. Yeah, the the the, the willingness to, to question or the willingness to also provide rationale is such a key thing. I mean, sometimes like you touched on there, it's kind of like, why are you putting me on the couch here? This is just like a an arbitrary whim of mine. But on on the other hand, it could be something really significant, like it's making people doubt the health of the company. Mm-hmm. And it's really key. Um, you've spoken about the dangers of framing the world in binary terms before. And that's often something that we see play out in our own lives on the media, where it's really easy for us to paint the term, the world in terms of black and white and ignore all the shades of grey in between, uh, just jump to conclusions without really having an inquisitive mind as to why people did a certain thing or are not doing a certain thing. Now, you've said something about the risk inherent in this, and I just want to quote you again. This is a little bit of a long quote, so bear with me, but I feel like it's important for the overall context of the question to follow. You've said, oftentimes there is a demand that team members bring, like, change this bigger picture for everyone. Like, this is inherently binary good or evil. Either you have a job or you don't, either you have a client or you don't, or you do this thing or you don't. But actually, we should really start with, how do I impact myself And then how do I show others that they can have that impact? And then maybe with the change we can make, we can impact the bigger company. So it sounded like to me there you were challenging people not just to rail against the status quo, but also to look inward, uh, look into themselves. So what is it, if if that is a correct way of interpreting what you were saying, what is it that you feel that people would gain by starting with themselves And what does it look like in practical terms? Like how do you do that when you run up against something that you really are annoyed by or that you really want to change? Mm -hmm. I think starting with yourself, it it gives you a sense of whether or not you're also the other end of that binary. And, And being able to kind of see and hopefully frame that is important. And then being able to understand because after that, you're probably going to hit a wall. If it's, if it's such a binary in your head that you're probably not going to make that much change, to be honest you know, especially in in a big corporation, are you going to get them to cancel that customer because they 
they build vapes and you don't believe in getting children hooked on, you know, candy flavored vapes and causing lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't believe in that, are you really going to get your company to cancel that? Or are you more thinking of the impact of, you know, okay, if I start with myself, if I'm working in the sphere, what can I do? Can I ask to not be put on those projects? Because, you know, this is something you feel very strongly about. You you bring up examples and say, you know, this just doesn't work for me. Can I work on other projects? And then you can ask yourself after that, if I'm able to help people understand that they have a say in their own ethics or principles or worldviews, then maybe they can feel empowered to actually, you know, not just be like, I'm stuck working on a vaping product and I don't believe in smoking and tobacco. And being able to kind of push and help people feel empowered and being heard just a little bit. It doesn't change a company. A company's not going to give up their $20 billion contract or whatever it is, but you kind of have to see where you can influence yourself. And I, I feel like a lot of the screaming that we hear in social media and the news today just has to do with, it's just screaming out loud. Like we want everybody to go the opposite way, which is our view. And that's it rather than, okay, what, what steps of influence can we get to? Because all, like when I look at the U.S. political system for a long time, it was that negotiation. It was diplomatic within uh, the different people in the government, the senators, the presidents, et cetera. And being able to have those diplomatic conversations to meet some some sort of mutual consensus, some sort of compromise, that's really what the world has been when it comes to politics in, in the last many, many decades and probably millennia. But what's interesting is today is just either, you know, my way or the highway, or I'm just going to freeze everything. Like in the US right now, we're having this conversation about freezing the debt ceiling. You know, is one side going to agree with the other? Or are they going to say, we want all our terms, all or nothing. And then we all end up in this place where everything's frozen, interest rates go up, like it just impacts the people, because suddenly the adults in the room couldn't negotiate anymore. And so I feel like if we're able to have our team members, especially our, our early career team members, start to kind of look at what can I influence within myself? How can I show others that makes an impact and you know improve my quality of life? And then how could that maybe potentially change the tide of a corporation and a culture? Those are the things, those those grassroots, starting with yourself, starting with the individual, you know, one, two people at a time. That's what changes tides. <laughs> you really can't come from that top down. And, and throw everything abruptly. So I do think when a lot of people are looking at these kind of binary decisions saying, you know, I will only do this, it's like, okay, well, that's also a choice that you can make. But think about the impact you could make going into, you know, a company, let's just say a B2B SaaS company. It sounds really boring. Oh my gosh, it's so capitalistic, whatnot. But what if you could bring your ethical design skills, your inclusive design skills into an organization like that and show them something different? And slowly, like, you know, change the tide a little bit and show those coworkers that there's another way to work other than just, you know, chasing that latest deal or, you know, the latest customer. So I think those are all things worth considering. There's heaps in there as well. Uh, on the political side of things, I would hope that this is the case that while we see a lot of the polarized ends of the spectrum, most people globally, and I would like to think in the US as well, still don't live at that fringe, at that polarised end. And so what I'm what I'm thinking as you're describing like how you bring that back down to the context of work is that if you just go out and you're really angry and you paint yourself into a corner of being in one of those polarised ends of whatever the binary is, the people that are in the middle and that are subject to change, so the people that aren't the opposite of you, are going to be repelled by that or they're less likely to be listening to you as a result of you taking that really angry stance. But if you're able to demonstrate like you were talking about there in terms of your ethical approach to design, if you're able to do it through conversation, if you're able to show people rather than beat them over the head with something, there's actually something really powerful that you're touching on there, which is the ability to shift the status quo over the longer term because those shifts come from the people in the middle that haven't yet closed off all their hearts and minds to uh, doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And John Maida used to say this when we were working um, to, to make some change early on is he would basically refer to the team as, you know, you're going to have your ones or twos, the people who are net detractors from you. You are not going to change their mind for whatever reason. They're just not going to like you. And that's OK. You leave them there. Uh, don't don't engage. Don't waste your breath. Don't provoke. You're going to have your fours and fives who are just for whatever reason they're behind you. You could just say, you know, 
design is engineering. We're all going to learn to code and they're going to come with us just because they're such believers. He's like, the people we want to focus our energy on is the people in the middle because they could be swayed either way. And so if you're really trying to make change and change that tide, that's where you want to focus is everybody in the middle who, you know, if you just happen to be unlucky in the office and you're siloed by, you know, toxic positivity or toxic negativity, you're going to go that direction because you hear it all day long around you. You're on that project, you're on that team, you sit next to that person. And so I thought that was always a nice way to look at it was focus your energy on the people in the middle because everybody else has made up their mind. That's often not the thing that gives people that immediate sense of gratification. Now, there's something powerful and satisfying about being angry with something. Um, it's often harder to take what you're, what it sounds like you know, you're touching on there and what John's talking about, which is a sort of a longer term view of how you're going to be and the change that you're going to make. I want to drill down into a specific, another specific example that you've shared previously about your uh, mentoring of designers. And it was tied into this. This is like a, a, a grassroots on the ground type practical ethical quandary that one of your mentees was having. And that was they were given a directive to remove the flag of and from a country drop down. Now your mentee was so this is undoubtedly a situation that caused them being the person that was going to make that change a lot of strong feelings about what it was they were being asked to do. What did you say to them about this particular situation? I believe if I had shared Taiwan I was trying to obfuscate the actual situation probably because it was fresh at the time. It was actually the flag. Uh, uh, right. For a client who had a large base in and they said, our clients aren't going to want to see that flag in there because it's not a country, it's part of uh, And to make this even more complex, I'm from So, mm -hmm. ooh, and hearing that, wow, the feelings I had, and then I had to distance myself from them and say, okay, what is it that you need? Because it's not about my feelings about it. And that, wow, that was such a such a throw because I I remember throwing down on leadership saying, you know, when you say nothing about this, you are saying something. By staying silent, you are being, you're sending a very loud and clear message to those of us who are reading between the lines because leadership refers, refused to say anything about it. And so that's the best I could do in the situation was say, hey, let's go ahead and move you to another project. You're going to have to turn a blind eye and ear to this. We're not going to win this one. Uh, we're not going to take this all the way up and we're not going to cancel that client here. But it was such an interesting ethical dilemma because for me, everything inside was ready to throw down and say, no, you know, F this, flip the table. I'm not working here. This is that kind of client. Like I really felt that way. And that's exactly throughout this whole talk where I'm like, you should calm down and not do those things. Uh, but you know, when it is very close to you, like, feelings right they come up and and it really does kind of shade it when when it feels like such a very clear question of you know this is just human rights so this was also during all of the uh and all that so i think this was a very very kind of openly seen political situation as well so it wasn't just um some people from some country feeling like oh you're deleting my flag but i Ultimately, I think where where I learned kind of my medium on that and where I felt I had learned a lot being an executive was being able to have that conversation with somebody and realizing that at the end of the day, they were really weren't trying to say we should cancel this client, like get me off this project, remove me from the sphere of this situation. And that's good enough because they also recognize, yeah, it's kind of a big client for the company. We're not getting rid of them. But also, I'm not going to change a tide by, you know, fighting to not delete the flag from one website because you know what the next designer in line is more than happy to delete that from the figma file <laughs> mm. and, and hand it off to the engineer so they they recognize that you know their their stance right there it wasn't going to make a big change but there was a way where they can remove themselves from the situation and just help people understand like this thing happened i just want to be able to share it with my teammates this is why i got myself off the project and what i believe in just help them understand this is why it matters to me and they were able to, within the company, like have a conversation with those teammates and explain, you know, this is what this means right now. This is what's happening. You know, it's happening to my family. And I think that was the important part that they felt heard and they could share and educate others in that situation. And although uh, other folks, you know, they ended up doing the work, they still, they didn't feel betrayed by it. They said, hey, I get it. It's the work. But now that you understand where it's coming from, like, that's the best I can feel about this is I, I help somebody understand why I was heated about it. Well, let's go into that further from the perspective of your perspective, 
being the executive and being someone who's from so like you said, you kind of had to, in that mentor relationship, uh, take a step back and park your own feelings, but clearly you, you still had them. You know, they didn't necessarily just disappear. Where does that sit with you now, like reflecting on that time, that situation? Like where did you put that? Like how did you, uh, did you just bury it and move on and just accept it? Or like is this something that's um, that's still very much part of what you wrestle with when you're dealing in a, in a global uh, global business world? It's something I still wrestle with today, not just the example, but other other considerations. So, um, you know, you and I, were we start talking about being able to have really bold conversations in here. So I work at a Hispanic-focused health tech company in the United States. Pride Month is coming up. Do we say something on our social media to what is a largely Catholic, largely conservative, largely older audience that follows us on social media? Do we say we're aligned, we're allies, we'll treat any body with any body, like however they recognize themselves? Do we do that? So these are things that still come up today. And I wanted to get ahead of that with my team because we do have a have a strong LGBTQ plus space within our team where, you know, we're having great conversations and learning and particularly about impact in medical and me- mental health for, for the community. And we're talking about two underrepresented communities here and the intersection of that. Like, where do we find our voice that represents our team and their values, but also respects where our patients are (laughs) the answer so far (laughs) that we've gotten to is we want to say something we have kind of formulated some language about how we want to bring that up but the more important part was it wasn't coming from above that we said this is all we're going to say because there's one way i could have just said this is the this is the sentence this is all we're going to say during the month of june on our social media that's it that's the only thing we're going to do and say Uh, versus bringing up the situation in all its context to my team and in that LGBTQ plus channel, ask the team like, okay, does, do you have ideas on what we could do, what we could say, like how we can kind of balance this knowing the demographic of our patients and the ones who follow us on social media. And I think that kind of opened people's eyes to say, okay, we get that. Like I talk to these patients, like I'm a clinician. I, I completely understand where they're coming from. Like my parents are still like that. So I think there is an in-between of like what we can say where we're not alienating them because we still want them to feel safe to come to us with care, for care in Spanish because there's basically uh, no, not a lot of solutions out there and not a lot of Spanish speaking uh, clinicians out here in the United States. And so we know that our, our help is necessary, but we don't want to alienate our own population and community that's coming in for help. And so as a team, we've kind of come together on, okay, this is where we think we should land on a statement. And we're all pretty okay with that. You know, we know it's not as bold as we would like to be as a company or a team. However, we understand that if we alienate people, they're not going to come to us for help and they're going to have no one else to go to. Yeah. And that's really it, isn't it? And in the context of what you're doing with Mesolude, it's trying to reduce the gap or close the health equity gap that exists Mm -hmm. for the Latinx community in, in the U.S., uh, yet you're, what you're talking about there is this tension or this trade-off between also being public as a company about what you believe in, in terms of LGBTQ plus equity. And you could look at this from a binary framing and go, oh, it's just all about the money. Yep. You Very go, easy oh, to say. They don't yeah. care about it. Yeah. They yeah, don't care they about don't. us. They only care about the customers. Yeah. yeah, but you're trading off here your mission, which is an equitable mission. So there, are, this is again like many shades of grey. Like you don't want to cut your nose off to spite your face and not be able to have impact in closing that health gap. But ha- coming back to the example, there are, and I don't know if this is the case, so I'm just projecting here, but sometimes people may be right in their assertion that companies are simply not willing to take a stand on certain issues because it only comes down to the dollars. Yeah. I mean, to put it frankly, it was, it was a handful of us that it mattered to in the United States within that team. A very, like I can count us on one hand probably. That was it. Mm. So not loud enough. Doesn't matter that I had whatever title, just not loud enough, not big enough, not enough of us for that to matter. But if we were to say, okay, the company is working on a project where they want to remove any references to trans visibility, 
and LGBTQ plus space, especially coming up into Pride Month. Like, okay, so we're going to have enough momentum, enough noise that it will probably get that customer canceled. So there, a, a lot of it does come down to, you know, what is the impact of, of the employees and, you know, who's going to stand and be an ally and say, this is not right. And I think we're, all, <laughs> I sound horrible and defeatist on this as I'm thinking about it, but we're always going to lose on a front. We're just not a lot of people. Have you, you've said that though, and and yet I'm thinking about you know this geopolitical state at the moment. Maybe we're getting into topics that are outside <laughs> of Brave UX purview, but I feel it's relevant. And and so far as there's talk out there that if <laughs> invaded, <laughs> uh, which they wouldn't see it as an invasion, but say that happened, that would we see the same response or a similar response that Western democracies have taken to Russia's actions in Ukraine? where pretty quickly even international bodies like the, the Olympics, for example, and, and others have made it impossible for Russia to compete even in sports and for those athletes to be representative of their country. So it's almost like, again, I'm just going where my, where my head's going, so feel free to jump in, but it's almost like you talked about if it was an LGBTQ issue at work that you would have enough momentum um, as a result of the employees that identify in that group and the people that are allies to that group to actually get that client cancelled. So it's almost like once there's critical mass against a certain action, whether it's a company that's taken it or a government that's taken it, that, um, that companies will follow. They don't necessarily lead, but they will follow because they will they will weigh the relative risk of pursuing the course that they're on versus changing it and pursuing something different. Yeah, and I do think that momentum matters. And if you think about a um, similar but completely different example, Bud Light recently, if you've heard about that in, in the marketing campaign in the U.S. where they used a, uh, a trans influencer, I believe, or model yes. yeah, uh, yeah, to yeah. promote – but like beer to get to a younger, more, you know, open liberal audience. And then basically all the conservatives try to cancel Bud Light and their stocks did go down for a little bit and then they kind of balance back out. Even things like that, I think there's, there's a lot of noise, but there's also the other side of the noise. And then I think uh, companies can decide where they kind of want to end up on this is, you know, do they want to be brave and try to find a new market? Or do they think that the existing market was, was enough momentum for them to, fire the marketing person or did they put them on leave or something like that? One of the two and, and, and kind of retract their statements and try to blame some nameless agency about this, you know, like kind of <laughs> yeah. make things like that. That's, that's how it ended up with Bud Light. So um, I'm, I'm going to poke one last thing on all of this is yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that in, in all of that conversation of shades of gray, um, this brings me back to just like the other day I was on BART, which is in San Francisco, one of the trains here. There was a guy who seemed kind of volatile sitting behind me and he was just muttering to himself like F this, F that. Like, we got those people in San Francisco. It happens. Uh, I felt slightly uncomfortable because I'm like, dude, if he decides to do something, like he's literally going to stab me in the back first because I'm sitting right in front of him. So at the next stop, I got up and I moved to another seat facing the door. And after that, for the rest of my four stops, I just got like endless, like you effing chink and all these other slurs thrown at no me. Way. And I'm just like, should I just move to another car? There's enough people now looking that they're like, okay, hopefully this guy doesn't attack me. And did no one, like, did no one speak up? Nobody spoke up. No one but spoke up. I, I think it, the thing there is just, I don't think that enough people are willing to be brave and be allies when the situations come up. It has, it's usually the people who are already brave and allies or, you know, part of the community that are, are used to having their voice and speaking up. And I, I think that's going to always be the challenge in turning that tide is I'm not sure how many new allies you really create in these kind of uh, hot topic situations. Thinking about that situation and not to make excuses for no one speaking up, this is not what I'm trying to do, but just thinking about the my own experience in Auckland recently in New Zealand here, we've had an increase in violent crime. And while we don't have the gun problems that you have over there or that I understand you've got over there. Like I believe there's a mass shooting almost every day in the States, which again is another topic for another day. But I've certainly, we've had some road rage incidents where someone was dragged out of a car recently and stabbed Ooh. to death with a screwdriver wow. um, just for not even, it wasn't even their fault. And it does send a chill down people's spine when they think about the risks to their own self by saying something. Mm -hmm. And I feel as a society, in New Zealand at least, we need to get on 
on top of this violent crime because we don't want people to withdraw so far within themselves that they're not willing to take a risk in a situation like on the BART where someone's saying something that's clearly racist and upsetting that they're not willing to stand up because they're concerned about their own you know, physical, physical safety. Like that just shouldn't really be a thing uh, for yeah. us, but it is. It is a consideration. Then to go all the way back to Japan, uh, Japan has such a unique special culture that it's one where society is looking out for the greater society. Like your actions are generally geared towards the better of the society. They have this great show on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called like coming of age or something like that, or first task, first errand depends on the country you're in. It has different names. And it's about Japanese children who, you know, when they're like anywhere between three and six, they get their first task from the parent. It's kind of like the coming of age moment. The parent will tell you to do something, like mail this letter or here's five dollars and go to the store and buy carrots. And the kid will go take that task alone, like cross streets, take trains, go to the grocery store. And, you know, the grocery store clerk is going to say, oh, OK, your mom told you to come for what? Carrots and curry. OK, you forgot your curry. Go back and get it. Let me get it for you. All right, where's the money? And then they take the money and they put the change back in the kid's backpack and the kid goes home safe. And it's this coming of age moment um, where the parents are in tears like his first task alone. So beautiful because society is looking out for them and you, you can let them do that. Um, they can take trains as elementary school kids to go to school and it'll be OK. And people will ask, you know, hey, it wasn't that the school stop. You should have gotten off and people will look out for the kids. But there are other countries um, where it is very well known, especially now with TikTok and all the video services where you see things like, OK, somebody got run, you know, hit, hit by a car and everybody was just looking and was walking by. Or, you know, these terrible things happen. People just look and walk by. And I, I see a contrast in those two types of societies, but it's heartening and also, you know, distressing to hear. Like with New Zealand, you expect that people should step up. But you're hoping the culture doesn't kind of degrade to a point where nobody, like it's normal to not step up. I am personally feeling pretty dark about the tra trajectory that we're on and feel like there are some significant changes both within individuals and at our um, governmental and societal level that need to be made to perhaps put us back on on course. Um, I don't have any solutions and um, I just want to pick up on something that you were saying earlier there about society looking out for these children in Japan, for example, that are on their mission, you know, their first coming of age task. I want to talk with you about something that I feel is a mission that you've been on and you've been looking out for certain people in society and that's evidence through your time at WiseLine at Publicis and also at Amazon, where you've sought to enable designers to grow in their careers, to make design more inclusive as a result of the types of designers or the types of people that you're bringing into design, into the field. What was it that lit this specific fire inside of you? Probably a whole bunch of imposter syndrome. If I were to be like, if I really dig in the root of it, um, a whole bunch of imposter syndrome. I grew up in a time where for me to have had that dream Google internship, my junior or senior year of university, I needed to be like a 3.95 or above. It's nowhere near that. Like I, <laughs> my GPA barely graduated. <laughs> so I think it's, it's something that uh, probably is, is that kind of resistant and fight back part of me of, you know what, you don't need to be UC Berkeley or Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, whatever mega fancy university title um, to go work in a uh, big tech company or any of these places. Like there are people who will open those doors and ungatekeep. And I, I, I genuinely can't tell, <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably won't be more on the negative side of this. I genuinely think that a lot of people will gatekeep that you need that for your university. And then if you're in the U.S., all of that student debt, to put it that way, because they had to do it. It's the kind of like, oh, I had to suffer, so everybody after me better suffer. And I genuinely think there's two types of people. And I, I tell this is, are you going to be the type of person who's like, this is really hard for me. I'm going to make it freaking hard for you. Or mm. this was really hard for me. It's got to be better for other people. Yeah. That's your, like, that actually is a binary. You get yeah. to be one or the other, and there's really kind of no gray space in between. You can't say, I'm going to make it tough for some people and not tough for others. And I, I think I've just chosen the path of, like, why not make it easier for others? And I think that also falls into my, my UX design background and spirit. My whole job in what I do is to try to make things easy for people to meet their goals. And why wouldn't I treat employees, candidates, um, people within the design industry the same way? 
like they are my product. And I think actually uh, probably heard in me in other talks say this, which is I think that design people, the moment you step out of Figma, you forget all those beautiful inclusive principles about learning, research, hearing others, trying to understand your audience. We forget those things the moment we step out of Figma. And then we fight with our engineering, product, marketing, sales colleagues. And then, you know, we fight with everybody. It's just like, come on, use the same principles that you know every day in your life. Because that's why we do this work, right? Because we want to make things easier for people. At least that's, that's I guess, how I started it. It's funny you're talking about the two types of people, the ones that want to make it better and then the ones that just want to impose same the same or more level of pain on people coming up. My wife's in medicine and she's not yet a specialist, not yet a consultant. And she's certainly experienced those two uh, mm -hmm. binaries and her time coming up in that field. It's certainly a field that likes likes, I would say, go so far as to say it loves its hazing rituals, mm -hmm. these, th these things that we do to people for no other reason other than we feel that they were done to us. Uh, let's go into the Amazon UX design and research apprenticeship program because this is a really great example of some change that you were able to make. And no doubt you had help, but the change that you were able to make through that, you, know, you sought to remove the inaccessibility of a career in UX and design. And you talked about not needing to go to those fancy universities, not necessarily having to conform to some sort of predefined mold here. How did you do that? How did this come to be? And how did this program actually enable that to happen? Um, it started with Amazon. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to make change. And I, I, the leaders who came, the design leaders who came together at Amazon to, to convince the organization they needed that change, they wanted to put this program together, those are the people to credit. They believe in something that something needed to change. They believed in opportunity and the people it could open doors for. And I think that's incredible to be able to work with people like that and then build that program. Um, that part was the easy part. <laughs> uh, I jokingly tell people that uh, I might've been one of the few people who joined Amazon and said, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. It was really, uh, uh, maybe because I, I loved it. Like it was a delight to do that work. And that's why I felt it was easy. It was a lot of work I had done before at other organizations but it was always my plus one nights and weekends job on top of my regular job. And in, in the case of Amazon, they were going to pay people, 32 people that we hired uh, as apprentice full time for a year and then guarantee them a headcount that they could graduate into after that. So a full time living wage, like an amazing living wage coming from Amazon too, to, to enter into a big tech company and get that credential on your resume. Like that was incredible. And that's, in my previous programs, because they were very nights and weekends, um, people often had jobs or, you know, they were they were doubling up and trying to do, be a career switcher from one role to another. And it was a burden on them. And this really opened doors to people who wouldn't be able to have that extra time. Um, people who were coming in from just basically interest and curiosity and demonstrated in user research or user experience design uh, that they hadn't been able to actualize. There were some folks who who came in and said, you know, my friends have always told me this is what I focus on. I didn't know it was a job and now they're an amazing user researcher. So I, I, I really love the opportunity and the belief in it. And what I did was just kind of build the motions in place to get everybody in. But I do think that where we did make a miss was we made a lot of assumptions um, because even in my previous two companies, Publicis and uh, WiseLine, when I built these programs, these were tech relational people like they had heard of tech companies or they had had full-time office desk jobs. The majority of the people coming into our Amazon program did not come from any kind of full-time desk job, much less remote in a pandemic. And so I think where we made a miss was not starting with a kind of like corporate etiquette basics. Like let's talk about when you join a meeting or when you like even something like how many times a day you should check your email and that you should be living by your calendar. And that's it. Like whatever your calendar says, you're going to go do that. Like, during that time, and, you know, these things that seem normal to you and me, but even today when I'm working with uh, our, our Hispanic community, a lot of agriculture farm workers who, who utilize me salute, they schedule appointments with us and half of them don't even come on time or even come at all because they're like, oh yeah, I had an appointment. I couldn't remember when that was because they don't live on calendars, right? <laughs> so it, it is a very, very different mindset to kind of transition into. And I, I would say that's my big learning lesson going forward is you know, if, we're, if I were to help people transition into a desk job environment, I think there's there's a set of training that needs to happen there first. Yeah, wow. That's like a really fundamental insight. And and we all take it for granted, right? Yeah, like, well, that's that's yeah. the thing. It's our, We're in our bubble. 
we're in that fishbowl. It's very difficult to see it from from an outside perspective until I suppose you've brought those people in. Like, why why are they not turning up to the meetings on time? Yeah. What is this all about? Yeah, um, I understand that part of the program was training, like a training course, and then there was mm-hmm. like roughly half of it was you know, on on the ground in the field and yeah. doing the role that they were going to then go on to to do. One of the modules though in the training course, and I was fascinated by this. It was a, a major module on writing. Mm-hmm. So what does writing have to do with designing? Uh, I would say that it has a lot to do with design, but at Amazon it has a lot to do with Amazon. Amazon is a very heavy writing culture. They don't do presentation decks. They write, you know, one pagers or six pagers. Uh, and if you can't concisely explain and bring the data in without flowery language, like it's amazing, it's huge. Like you have to give data about these things. Um, then you're not going to be able to get your project or whatever uh, approved. And the thing with Amazon in that writing culture is I think it really helped a lot of people distill the arguments they're going to make because these are the same things you have to say out loud. And, you know, if you're going to make a big presentation like that, you're going to write those things down first, but you need to learn how to, how to be uh, influential in that kind of decision-making and pushing people with the right data. And I think that's really important from the Amazon perspective. And then second is from a UX perspective, wow, writing is so important. I would say the most pivotal thing I've ever done in design that helped me be a better designer was when I became a product owner and I had to sit in Jira and write freaking stories and acceptance criteria all day long that I had some very pedantic engineers who were like, well, the acceptance criteria didn't specifically say that. That's why I didn't do that. And I was like, okay, let me learn to write (laughs) and use words to describe design and interaction in such a way that you hit every single point. And that helped me with clarity of thought and uh, work. And I would say for me as a designer, until I could verbally articulate these things, visuals weren't going to help get my point across because it comes down to, you know, are people visual thinkers? Are they listeners or are they readers? And I think that there's at least those three types of people out there. And there's a lot of people who just don't see the same visual detail. That's why you have designers coming in saying during the QA process, you missed all of this or the pixels are off or the interaction's not the same. And the engineer's are like, yeah, this drop down's a drop down, like a drop down. There you go. Uh, so being able to ha- help people understand in their language, I think is really important to our jobs. Mm, what a gift it must have been to have given or for those people to grow into that uh, capability of being able to clearly communicate through their writing. It's such an essential, just outside of Amazon as well, mm-hmm. like such an essential skill, you, as you touched on in terms of building influence and also clarity of your own thinking that you mentioned as well. It's yeah. a hugely, hugely important skill for people to master. I'm just conscious of time and I'll bring this show down to a close now. I have a final question for you. And Wendy, you've worked with, managed and created these training programs that we've just been speaking of for a significant number of designers over the years. Now, from these experiences, from all this effort and energy that you've invested in this, the things that you've observed and the people who have participated in these programs, what is it that you feel that the people that were the most successful, that went on to become the most successful designers, understood that the ones that were less successful did not? I think they understood their peers. That's for me, the single thing you can be a fantastic designer. You can be so connected to your users and know, you know them inside and out their pain points, needs and goals, and you can design the perfect thing for them. But unless you can convince your peers, your engineers, product managers, your marketing people, this is why this needs to be built this way to meet the needs of these people. Unless you can actually articulate, negotiate, and influence people to go along with you or compromise of like, well, that's going to take engineering extra week. What if we, you know, loaded the data differently? That would take an hour. And until you can do that, you're not a successful designer. You are a successful artiste if you can create for your user, but you're a successful product designer or UX designer when you can actually execute and see those things through as you intended them so that the user can actually benefit from them. From them. And Back to kind of what I said earlier, the moment many designers step out of their design tools, they forget to apply that same thinking and compassion and empathy for their users to their colleagues to be able to kind of see these things through. And I think part of part of being a good 
team citizen, corporate citizen, or even world citizen is understand the people around you in their context. And, you know, you don't need to make space for them all the time, but you just need to understand where they're coming from so you know how to navigate. Wendy, such an important point and an important reminder. Thank you. I've really enjoyed today's conversation and you've given me plenty of things after we we hang up to think about for the rest of my day. Thank you for so generously sharing your stories and insights with me today. Hey, thanks for being a generous host and having such a great conversation with me. Oh, you're most welcome. It's been my pleasure. Wendy, if people want to connect with you, keep up to date with what you're doing with Me Salute and all the other things that you've contributed to the field, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter as UX Wendy, and then I'm also on LinkedIn. And my tip for LinkedIn, uh, give me some context why you're adding me or where you heard from me. I get a lot of randos and I just don't respond to the ones that say nothing. Mm, yeah, that's also an important point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Wendy. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that we've covered will be in the show notes as per usual, including where you can find Wendy and all of the things that we've spoken about will be completely chaptered spe- specifically on the YouTube video. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX research, product management, and design, don't forget to leave a review or rating on the podcast podcast subscribe so it turns up every two weeks and tell someone else about the show if you feel that they would get value from these conversations at depth if you want to reach out to me you can also find me on linkedin just type brendan jarvis and i'll pop up and please as wendy just said add a little note to explain how you found out about uh, me and what you want to talk about or you can head on over to our website which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz that's thespaceinbetween.co.nz and until next time keep being brave